All right, guys, welcome. Um, thanks for coming along. Um, for those that don't know me, my name's Ray. Um, a factory driver for Associated J Concepts and Reedy down here. Um, been racing for too long now, about 25 years. Um, and yeah, I'd like to make firstly a big thanks to Matt and the guys from, oh, and also Chad, but uh, the guys from uh, Associated Australia and the club here for inviting me to take part in this. Um, I've got my colleagues, obviously Matt, uh, Andrew Salvaggi has come with me from uh, Melbourne this morning as well. He, these guys are all on the AE team. Um, and we've got a couple of the juniors, we've got Lachlan and, and other Lachlan over there, two Lachlans, if you can't remember their name, it's easy. Um, so we'll be helping out. Um, yeah, so thanks very much for having me here. The purpose of today um, is to basically give a bit of a, a I guess, a, some theory on, on how to get good lap times, race line, a little bit of extra to get more out of your driving. Um, we'll do this by talking about a couple of things. Firstly, um, some of you guys might have heard the junior session, we talked a lot about racing line. Okay, racing line we'll cover a little bit. But I want to go one step beyond that, which is the tyres. Tyres are by far the most important parts to understand on your car. They're the only bits that should be touching the ground. Um, obviously, if you've got worn out tyres, you're going to struggle. But there are ways, there are certain properties tyres have, and there are ways that you can then drive to get the most out of them. I'd like to share a bit of that knowledge that, that uh, exists out there. And then hopefully that can help you automatically adjust your driving to get more out of your, your car. Um, and we'll do a, a track walk and a bit of a demo. And then we're also going to add a little bit of jumping uh, skill in there. We've got Mr. Whippy Andrew here. <laughs> so, yeah, anyhow, we'll, we'll get started. Um, I guess if, um, yeah, we had name tanks for the juniors. I don't know if we will need them for adults. If you really want, just say your name. I, d I don't know everyone, so my apologies. I, I don't know everyone's name, and I'm pretty bad with names. So, um, if you've got any questions, just ask um, at any time through the session. I'll try to keep it casual and fun, hopefully. And, uh, yeah, we'll get started. Um, so firstly, yeah, I'm going to assume in terms of how to get fast lap time, we're all here to race. I'm assuming everybody's having fun, so we'll, we'll put that aside. <laughs> um, I'm assuming that everybody knows how to turn the car right and left, uh, and yeah, whether it's going towards you, coming away from you. They're the, if, you, if you're not having fun and you don't know how to do that, then this session might be a little bit tricky. Um, but I'm going to assume everybody here can do that. <laughs> most, <laughs> of <the time>. most, <laughs> most of the time. Most of the time. Bye, mate. <laughs> The secrets to, we're here to get fast lap times, and we're here to get fast race times. That's that's what everybody's racing for, to get the most out of themselves, out of their equipment, on the track, on the day. Um, as we've always said, with Lachlan, what's the different, what's winning, Moon Oh, sorry, you're eating. Um, <laughs> winning's not where you finish, it's how hard you try, and it's getting the most out of what you've done, right? So, the, the result you get, if you focus on your result, if you focus on coming first, you're never going to come first, unless you're a freak. If you focus on how to get the most out of your driving, how to get the most out of your car, how to get the most out of your setup, then the results will be as good as they can be. And then if your results happen to be better than someone else, than everyone else, you get first. Okay, so if you come into racing thinking that I want to get first, it's not going to work. If you come in thinking I want to work hard and how can I make my racing better, that's what I hope we can talk to talk through today. All right? Um, we're not going to, we'll touch on a little bit, but mental programming of your brain is one of the most important things you can do. Your reactions are a lot quicker than you expect if, you, if your brain's working subconsciously. So what we're trying to do with this discussion today is get things that are happening, turn them from being something you have to think about to being things that are automatic. So I guess, uh, Sam, if you're going to catch a ball, what are the steps you have to do to catch a ball? See the ball first. Yeah. Put your hands out. Yeah. Um, and sort of judge at what speed the ball's coming. And yeah. yeah. So Sam's had to think about that, right? What if I do this? Let's try that again. Ready? I'm just going to throw this, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so when you have to think about something, it takes time because you've got to think, what's the next step? What's the next step? What's the next step, right? Most people will catch that first time. <laughs> that was a really bad demo. Yeah. But, yeah, but because you've, when you're a kid, you, you, you've learned how to grow, you, to catch and follow, you, your brain automatically does that. It goes into this subconscious routine. So the more we can think about what are the right ways to do it, we program our brain to do it, your brain will then start to do it automatically. So the racing line is one of the most important parts of getting a fast lap. Um, yeah, we're here to get the car in the shortest space of time around the track. So you want to cover the shortest distance, the highest speed. You want a car, uh, the tracks are made up of, of corners where the fastest time around a corner is when your car's got the most grip and you can actually go around the corner fast. Um, between the straights, you want to go fast down the straight. Obviously you want power, but also you need the traction to actually make the car accelerate up to speed and slow down again. We can't just go full speed around the whole track. And also the jumps. 
this is where tyres come into it. Tyres are the things touching the ground, they're the things that give your car the traction. The more traction you've got, the faster you'll go around corners. Therefore, you'll carry more speed onto the next straight. You'll also be able to accelerate faster, you'll be able to brake later. So, getting the most out of your tyre traction is actually the most important part of, of not just RC racing, but, but racing cars in general. And there's a couple of properties that we'll go through that some of you guys might think about this stuff. I don't know how many of you have ever read up on tyre properties or anything. Um, for a lot of people, this stuff, you, you can feel it, but I'd, I'd like to explain some of the, the basic theory. There's three things that can kind of affect the grip that a tyre has. Firstly, probably the most obvious one is the amount of weight you put on. If you put more weight onto a tyre, it's going to have more traction. Um, but if you put twice as much weight onto a tyre, it doesn't actually get twice as much traction. It might get, say, 80%. This is the same for any tyre out there. But if, you've, if you don't have any weight on the tyre, you're not going to get any grip. If, you're going to put, if you've got more load onto that tyre, if it's pushing down harder, it will give you more grip. That's the function of tyre. <clears throat> just putting extra weight on a car, though, so why don't we just make a car super heavy? If the more weight you have in the car, the more that the tyre then has to push as well. So you give the tyre more grip, but it's, it can't necessarily make the car go any faster because it's got to work against more. But when the car's doing weight transfer and some dynamic things, we can start to think about what's the tyre doing. The more weight that's on that tyre, the more grip it's going to have. For instance, when we're accelerating, we get weight transfer. That, that switch shifts to the back of the car. You accelerate, the car leans back. The more that the car's leaning back, the more traction there is on that tyre. Okay, there's, that's one of the fundamentals to talk about. Um, the next one, though, is what's called the grip versus slip. So slip is basically um, the difference in speed. Zero slip means that the tyre is moving exactly the same speed as the ground. There's no slip at all, and it's measured in percentage. And 100% slip means that you basically, the car's stationary and you're doing a burnout. <clears throat> the amount of traction that the tyre generates actually is very linked to the amount of slip that you have. Um, if you don't have enough slip, actually, <coughs> basically as, as the slip starts to build up, firstly, the, the grip increases. So even when you're driving a road car on the road and you're accelerating away from the lights, if you were to have a very accurate sensor of how fast the tyre is turning versus the ground, there's a slight difference in speed as you accelerate. That's, that's one of the things that tyres need to generate grip. Once you get beyond a certain level though, this is when it starts to slide, it's what they call, it's non-linear, it actually reaches a point where there's a certain amount of slip that you have and that's, that can be either slip uh, accelerating or also like the, the, uh, the slip angle, which is the difference in angle between the tyre and the direction of the car. As they build up, there, there's an optimum point, which is here. And then once you get past that, with more slip or more spin, the traction actually drops off. Um, this is this is a function of rubber. It's a function of the the interface that rubber and things have with the ground. But pretty much every tire has this type of phenomenon. Okay, so basically, the in terms of grip, we want to be driving at the maximum level of grip. If we're not at the maximum level of grip, our car's not going to corner fast enough. It's not going to accelerate hard enough. The trick is feeling that, and that's one of the things that I think um, one of the mistakes I see made is people using too much steering in their car. Um, because what happens is you, once if you're, for instance, when you drive down the freeway, you, you're only gonna use a little bit of steering in your car. The faster your car goes, the less steering angle you need. Low speed, you need to put in a lot more. Corners like this at the end of the straight, I often see people think their car's under steering and they're cranking full steering into their car. What they've actually done is gone right past here. You've gone past the point at which your tire's actually gripping correctly. So, Sometimes when you think that your car's understeering, it's actually that you, you're just putting too much steering lock in. And then what usually happens is as you exit the corner, almost all the time, your car then hooks around and oversteers. And that's because as you've taken the steering away, you, you're actually you, you're thinking that you're taking steering off. But what you're actually doing is coming back and giving the tyre more grip. So this fundamental property of tyres when it comes to steering and driving uh, is really important to try to feel with the steering to not use too much steering angle and feel up to the grip of the tyre but also <coughs> um, how hard you push the car. If you if you don't push the car hard enough you're going to be down here. The car's going to look very stable. If you've ever seen cars that you think man that looks really good but their lap time's terrible that usually means that they're down in this range. That they're very stable because they're not actually pushing the limit of the car. Then you'll see someone like maybe Ryan Mayfield cars on the limit, ragged edge. To be honest he's probably about here. 
past the limit, but he's able to control it. So he's 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 worked out how to get that limit and drive right on the edge. Um, if you watch guys like Tebow and Cavalieri, their cars look super smooth. But when you see them in person, they're fast. They're they're driving on like in this area here where they haven't gone past the peak. They're driving just enough slip, just enough aggression in the car to get the most out of your car. So when, when it comes to driving, and each surface and each condition, it's a little bit different. But understand there's a, there's a point where you can be too soft on the car and a point where you can be too hard on the car. Once you understand this, you can start to, to, to feel for it. Um, acceleration is another really good example of this. If you accelerate really softly, yeah, the car will go away straight, but it won't necessarily uh, go as quick as it can. If you just mash the power, it's, you're going to go straight past this zone here into a lower grip and the car will, will do a lot of wheel spin before it takes off. Okay. When we, we talked before a little bit about weight transfer, weight transfer is when you accelerate and the car squatting down at the back. With a tool drive, this is a really important uh, thing to, to, to think about as you're driving. If you go instantly to full power, and you haven't put enough weight back on those rear tyres and you just go straight to no grip, the car's going to spin. But if you can squeeze the throttle to the point where you feel, when you get it right, the car actually, as it accelerates, it squats down on the back, you're now giving the tyres more grip. You can squeeze the power a bit harder, it will squat down harder, you squeeze it harder. You'll actually feel like the car, uh, it's almost slingshots off the line. Um, we'll do a bit of a demo of that later on when we when we finish this uh, when we finish the talk. But this, it's a really important part to feel all the time in your car. Is there's a combination of the tyre working and the chassis working. If you're too gentle, you're not going to be able to get enough traction. If you're too aggressive, you don't get traction. But if you keep uh, working the car, so in, when it comes to the throttle, especially with our electric cars, there's always squeeze and keep pulling them on. That once the car's accelerating and squatted down, you can keep squeezing and squeezing and squeezing. You get to a point where the car actually accelerates harder than it could have um, just just off the line. Okay, so a lot of that's to do with this slip and grip. Um, yeah, and the big one, as I mentioned, fast corners. Try not to use too much steering. Slow corners. Yeah, use as much as you as you want. Okay. Third one, which is a really important one, and this is what ties a lot of driving together, is what's called the friction circle. Uh, hands up, who's ever heard of that here? <laughs> oh, you guys have. <laughs> the friction circle is a fundamental property of tyres, and this is whether you're racing a Formula One car, uh, uh, or a, an RC car, or on-road, off-road, this is one of the fundamental things. When we look at the tra traction of a tyre, it's got to work in four directions, basically. The wheel from the top of the car. Um, it's got to provide, if we want to accelerate, the traction has to go forward. So this is like looking at the tyre here, right? So we need to provide a certain amount of grip to go forward. Or if we're braking, the traction actually goes backwards. Um, if we're cornering left, the force has to go this way, and right, the grip has to work that way. A tyre has a certain amount of grip, but the thing is it can't provide maximum grip in every direction at all times. So when you actually measure it, and you can put tyres on, there are, there are test rigs out there that measure tyres. Um, not very common in RC, but in full size you can get this kind of data. And it basically looks very close to a circle. It's not a perfect circle, but it's like a circle. And it says that your tyre can provide basically that much grip. This is it, this much grip. But what if you look at, for instance, the maximum amount of grip that it can provide in pure acceleration is say this amount. But as you start, if you want to have some combination of corner and acceleration together, that traction, that it, before you start sliding, follows a circle here. So, what this means, if you want maximum cornering, you don't want to be doing any accelerating or braking. Because as soon as you've, you want to have your maximum grip here, as soon as you're accelerating or braking, you're, you're losing some of the grip that the tyre had. If you want maximum acceleration, you don't want to be cornering. Anytime you try to combine the two together, you can't get the maximum out of both of them at the same time. That just won't work. However, if you're really good, you can actually, and I guess the flip side of that is the kind of uh, traditional technique. So let's talk about, say, braking and turning. <coughs> um, if you are trying to brake, so you're hard on the brakes and you're using up all the grip of the tyre, let's say a two-wheel drive, to slow the car down, and then you turn, what's going to happen to the car? Yeah, 
So the car's stopped, but you've taken away. There's no, you're here. There's no cornering grip left in that tire. Absolutely none. You're on the limit of braking. There's no lateral grip left. So that's why, even when you're on a push push bike and you do a brake lock up, you kind of feel the rear's always got that slide. You've taken away all the side grip. So one of the kind of old school techniques is okay. You brake in a straight line, and then you let go of the brake, and then you turn. So you've given the you've given the tire back its grip. What you've done there is gone from this point of braking here, and then you've let go of the brake, so there's no traction required from the tire, and then you've gone out to cornering. So you've you've stayed in the grip of the tire, but you're missing all this traction that was available from the tire. <clears throat> so the 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 most advanced technique, the fastest way to go, and honestly the most difficult thing, this is the most difficult part of, of uh, driving any vehicle on the limit, is this this transition they call it, the, as you go from uh, either accelerating, braking into cornering, following the friction circle. Ideally what you want to do is, is have the maximum amount of traction come out of your tyre at all times, right? That's how you're going to get the fastest lap time. That means that the car's going to be changing direction as quick as possible, cornering, accelerating, everything. So. How do we stay on that there? We'll talk about the, uh, the five stages of a corner. Um, this is, I think, one of the most important things to, to try to understand because it's not something that you necessarily feel without thinking about it. Once you think about it, I can guarantee you'll be able to actually... There might be some things that have been confusing in the past about why the car's done a certain thing. First section is braking. So let's take the example of this corner here uh, coming in before the the triples. When we're coming along, you, you, you're approaching that quite fast. So the first stage of a corner is pure braking. You're going in a straight line, you, you've got to slow the car down first so you can make the corner. Okay. So when you, if you want to get maximum braking, you need to be on the brakes hard, but keep the car straight. And you feel that one especially, because there's a bit of a curve in it, I guess I'd say most people here would have felt that if, the, if your car's turning a little bit and you get on the brakes, it suddenly snaps sideways. Right? That's because you're trying to you're trying to brake hard, but you're also still trying to use some cornering grip. So you've got to get the car straight and brake hard. The, I'll skip to the third stage of cornering, which is in the middle of the corner. So when you're in the middle of the corner, you don't want to be accelerating or braking. You want the car to be getting its full cornering grip and just, just steering. It's the transition from step one to step three that's the most difficult. So there's a few different words for it. There's trail braking, there's blending, there's a few different things. Basically, you're on the brakes hard first stage. And then you start to slowly release the brake as you start to put the steering on. And then what you're doing is as you're reducing the amount of brake you want, you're starting to add steering. And you go from uh, full brake, no steering, to some brake, a little bit of steering, a little bit of both, and then mostly steering, no brake, and then full steering, no brake. That kind of transition or blending is the way to get the most out of your tyre on the track. Um, exactly the same when you exit the corner. So when your car's cornering, if you wait till the car's completely straight and then accelerate, you're actually missing this point here where you could be using some traction of the tyre. So once the car has started to get all the way through the corner, then as you start to let the steering off, that's when you can start to put some power back on. You can't go full power or else it's going to spin out. You don't have, you're still trying to get some grip out of the tyre. Um, but if, you, and if you're too slow, then you're just missing a bit of lap time. And also, again, if you're not if you're not aggressive enough, you're not going to transfer the weight and get the power. But those five steps of of, of a corner, the trail break in where you're blending from braking into steering, and then transition from steering into acceleration, they're the bits that lap time come from. Anyone can pull the trigger hard in a straight line. Anyone can push the brakes hard and stop the car quick. Most people can turn pretty fast. It's it's how you get between them that's the difference between the pros and the non pros. If you've ever been to a track um, with guys like Cavalieri or Tebow or any of those guys, you see that they, they seem to be able to go very quick down the straight and still and brake late, but still be able to make the corner, and their car looks like it's turning the whole time. Those guys have got that perfected where they're using the brake and the, and the cornering together, and when you get it right, your car feels like it really sucks into a corner. When you get it wrong, you suck, because you just go <laughs> flying the track, right? So it's a fine line, it's a hard thing, but it takes a bit of practice, and, and for that, this, at the end of the front straight, you've got a really good opportunity to practice that here as well. You're going really fast. Um, you need to wash off a bit of speed and then turn in. And also the, the section in uh, before the triple there, or before the double triple, they're good opportunities there. Um, actually, this technique, even in, uh, in Formula One, it's one of the ways that they judge how good a driver is. Um, I was very lucky to work in, in that uh, industry about 10 years ago. And that's, even at that level, what they'll do at the end of the race, they've got all the data that they can pick from the car 
but they also look at the driver. And what they look for is how much G-force he's able to hold in each direction. And the really good drivers, their G-force you'll see, will go like hard G from brake, and then as they turn in the corner, it will actually follow a perfect circle all the way around. And then same when they're on acceleration. The drivers that aren't quite so confident, they'll do it somewhat, but they'll, they'll tend to kind of take the edge off it like that. So it's actually a, uh, that's, that's a technique that's used right at the highest levels of racing to judge how good you are as a driver. Whether you're driving uh, a, a sedan car on, on the road or a, uh, you know, like a, a production race car or a, or a RC car, whatever, these things hold true. Okay. Um, I guess, is there any questions on that? It's a pretty kind of advanced sort of topic. So is that, yeah. has anyone come across that or heard about these terms before or is there any question on that? Does it make sense? I think it's one of these things that once you, I think a lot of people probably do it, they've, they've, they've worked out how to do it, but this is, the, this is the reason that it works. Once you start to understand the theory, you can start to make your driving, say, okay, well, this is how, like, this is physics, right? We can't get around that. So if you make your driving start to take advantage of that, then your technique will automatically improve because you can, you can be telling yourself to do these things because you know they're the right thing, rather than try to react to them, which is, which is what, uh, generally how you learn to drive is sort of reactive. This way you can be a bit more proactive. You can program your brain to do this, and then you can be in front of it rather than waiting for it. <coughs> so, so, <coughs> so based on that, there, that, that actually is one of the reasons why um, when, you, when you're looking at a track, one of the most important things that I find to do is a, is a track walk, which we'll do in a minute. Um, but what are you looking for when you do a track walk? Firstly, you're looking for, obviously, when you get down on the track, you're going to find the bumps and jumps and things that you can't see from the stand. Um, the driver's stand, especially here where there's some quite deceptive far uh, sections, if you try to get, learn everything from the stand, you're not going to do it. So we'll get down and get out onto the, the track level. But also what you're trying to do when you do a track walk is come up with a bit of a map like this to think about what's my racing line going to be. Using this kind of theory, um, we can come up with our racing line a bit better as well. So. Um, when you've got a very fast, like a fast section of corner like this here, we can start to look at maybe thinking where we might start braking, where we might have to let off the brake, where we'll be able to carry high speed. Um, if you've got a corner that's a tightening corner, you might start to want to wash off the speed and, and carry a little bit of brake all the way through there. Trying to think about how I can drive around the track that's going to make, let me stay right on the edge of the grip the whole time. The more grip we're using, the faster our lap time is going to be. We're working the tire harder. Just a question regarding the friction circle. So if you're going around an apex, for example, this one here, mm -hmm. you ideally want to be at that horizontal part, like full Correct. lock at the apex? Yeah. At the apex. Yeah, so let's, yeah. what I'll show you here is maybe just a very simplistic corner, all right? But let's say we've got a... Coming down this way. So our racing line, we're gonna, we, we want to be as close as possible to the apex through the middle of the corner, and we're going to start from the outside of the straight. So we're going to do something like this, exit that way. Basically, this section here, when you're completely straight, you want to be, let's call that section one, you want to be here, number one, right there, all the way through that section. In the middle of the apex here, basically, from about here to here, you're basically pure cornering. Three. That's where you want to be. Yeah. Right here. So you're using just pure cornering grip, no acceleration. This second stage here is basically where you want to be going from there to there. So part two of the corner, you're actually trying to transition through to there. But there, in this section here, you're going to hover there for a, yeah. a second or whatever the corner is. Okay. Then, as we accelerate out, section number four, we're going from a little bit of cornering, and then we're we're slowly reducing the cornering, but we're increasing the braking. So we're going this way, and then from here, you basically want to be going straight. Section five. Now. The way you drive this is a little bit different. There's a couple of things I guess we can talk about with the friction circle. Firstly, this is for a tyre. Okay, when you've, if you've driven different tyres, like especially bar tyres versus a pin tyre, 
A pin tyre tends to feel like it has more side grip, especially if it's dusty, but sometimes the forward traction is not quite as high. A bar tyre has very strong forward traction, maybe a little bit less side grip. So this pure circle isn't actually a circle in reality. Some, for some tyres, um, some tyres are very smooth like this and you get this nice feeling. Some tyres, you'll feel that they don't have very good transition, so if you were to measure them, they'd actually be like a kind of an oblongy sort of shape. Um, like I say, pin tyres are probably more like an oval this way, bar tyres are maybe an oval that way. When you're actually testing different tyres, you can start to think, what does that friction circle feel like? And it's, a, it's an easy way to then try to diagnose what the car's doing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when we developed the barcode V1 a few years ago, we were testing against the... Uh, the BK bar, which at the time was the main bar tyre out there, and that was a tyre, the, the, the BK bar was awesome forward grip, awesome side grip, but the transition between the two, the tyre the was always edgy, and then when we tested the barcode, which is a more uh, rounded shape of, of bar in it, we found that that was where the big difference was. It, it's pure forward traction, pure side traction weren't that different, but that transition was really different, and what that meant was you could lean on the tyre more into the corner, and then out of the corner, you could get on the power a bit earlier. But you've got to try and find that the feeling of that uh, around the track. But again, if you if you don't drive, if you if your driving style is going to be just jam the brake on, throw the car in, it doesn't matter what tire you got, you're always going to spin out. <laughs> so that's the, um, I guess yeah. It's, this is the theory behind why that why that happens. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yep, perfect. Sir? Thank you. Uh, any other questions on this stuff? Um, at the risk of boring everyone, then maybe we'll do a track walk first. Um, oh, actually, sorry, jumping. We'll do a little bit of basic talk about jumping first. Um, a couple of things with jumps. Um, I know a lot of guys, especially when you come from across from on road, it's a very different thing. Um, I mean, certainly compared to when I started racing, the jumps now are way, way bigger. There's a few very fundamental, basic things about jumps that I'd like everyone to remember, and then we'll talk a little bit more about some of the advanced ones a little bit later. Firstly, um, I think one of the most important ones is that once the car's in the air, your tyres aren't touching the ground, you've got no traction. So the more that you're in the air, the less grip you've got. Generally, you try to jump as little as possible. It doesn't look as good, but you try to jump as little as possible. You want your tyres to be on the ground gripping. Once your car has left the face of the jump, it's purely in the hand of hands of gravity and a little bit of aerodynamics. doesn't matter what you do with the steering or the throttle. You can, with those, you can make the car change its, its attitude. But if you were to look at the path the car's taking, whether your car is whipping or whatever, if you've taken off at this speed, pointing this direction, your car is going to keep going that way. Okay. So the most important thing is the takeoff. The speed and the angle of takeoff is absolutely the most important thing to get right so your jump is successful. Um, the, in terms of the control of the car, so that, that's basically, first of all, looking at how far do you want to jump and what's the shape of the jump. Once you're in the air, and your car's basically, the only thing that's affecting it is gravity and aerodynamics, which if you've tried short course is pretty important. Um, you, what you're trying to then do is control the attitude of the car so that when it lands, it's pointing in the right <coughs> direction and pointing, hopefully, uh, you want to be as smooth as possible with your landing so you can get straight back on the power. So once the car's in the air, there's a couple of bits of physics going on. Firstly, um, I guess probably everyone's familiar with that when you put the power on, the car's nose will go up. When you hit the brakes, the nose will go down. The reason for that is, uh, it's a term called conservation of <laughs> angular momentum. Basically, it's, a, it's inertia. The tyres and, and wheels and everything is quite heavy. So as you accelerate them, it takes a bit of effort to accelerate them forward. So you're trying to accelerate them forward, but physics tries to always balance forces, right? So that amount of effort it takes to drive those forwards is exactly what it puts in the chassis to drive it backwards in the opposite direction. So it's actually that, um, it's that opposite reaction of trying to drive the tyres forward that moves the chassis back. That's why four-wheel drive is so responsive in the air, because you're trying to accelerate four tyres, there's, there's twice the force that it takes, so it reacts by putting twice as much uh, force back into the car. The centre of gravity, if you were to, this is a bit of a physics nerd thing, but if you, um, if you were to put a, a, a dot on the centre of gravity of the car, and video it in the air, it will always follow a very smooth curve. No matter what the car's doing, the centre of gravity follows the curve. So what we can do with that throttle and screen though, is, is adjust that, that uh, attitude. When we leave the jump, if we leave the power on, where the, the tyres are going to spin up and instantly the, the nose is going to go up. That's pretty much, uh, you, you, you're pretty much guaranteed to have a crash after that. 
um, you really want to be letting off the power just before the, the car leaves the jump space. And then that way, you get a nice, smooth transition. If your car is nose up, then you want to be on the brakes as quick as possible. When you're on the brakes though, like you'll see some, um, one of the, the biggest mistakes I see with jumping is leaving the, the power on just that little bit too long. When you come up the jump and, and hit the power and the car goes nose up, then you hit the brakes and the car uh, comes forward. Yet the car's attitude like this, but you'll often see it kind of wobble around. That's because when your tyres aren't spinning, but when the tyres are spinning, there's a lot of gyroscopic stability. Like when you're riding a bike. Having, the speed, having things spin keeps things stable. As soon as you stop the tyres from spinning, the car just becomes a brick floating in the air. So try to keep the, the tyres spinning. So the best technique that I've found, uh, and I'm not the world's best jumper, but uh, the best technique I've found is just as you come up the face of the jump, you get the speed right and you let off the power just as it's about to leave. Normally then you get, your wheels are still spinning, the car's nice and stable, it should go nose down, and then you've got to, you can either hit the brakes or hit the power. You, you've got the options there. But if, you, if you're one of those drivers that's trying to hit the brakes every time and stop the car, and then you're wondering, why does my car feel like it's kind of floating and never landing properly? That's, that's probably one of the reasons. Especially full drive, your car just becomes a brick. Um, if your tyres are spinning, the car actually has some stability. Um, the little bit more advanced techniques, I guess, is you know, the, what's become more common in the last few years, the, the whipping or the uh, you know, turning the car in the air. If you turn the steering in the air, it doesn't actually change. The, the car's still going exactly where it's going to go. But, again, it's that gyroscopic effect. You've got a, a tyre spinning very, very fast. If you turn it to the right, what it will actually do is, it's the reaction of, of that is to tilt the car and pivot it to the left a little bit. So it pushes it away. Have any of you guys ever been on those um, things where you get a, 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 like a, a bike tyre spinning and you stand on it on a rotating? As you turn it one way, it always turns you the other way. It's exactly the same effect here. So what you're doing is you're not, you're not steering the car's path. It's still going in a straight line, but you can then, you can angle it. So if you're, generally you try not to do it, um, especially when you're learning. The best thing is a straight jump. But if you've got a corner, say you've got a, uh, like in the case of the far triple here, we've got a right-handed corner just after the jump. In that case, if we turn to the left when we're in the air, what will happen is the car will, it will still go in the same direction, but when it lands, it's now pointing a little bit to the right. So you can use that, that steering in the air to make the car land. And when it lands, it's then going to land pointing into the corner and it will turn into the corner. The risks are, if you do too much, um, when you land, the car hooks and rolls. Um, and the other thing is that if you forget to s turn the steering away, because basically the steering works opposite in the air, I definitely see this happen quite a bit. Someone does an awesome whip, yay! They land, they forgot to turn the steering, and then they spin off the wrong direction. <laughs> <laughs> so you've, you've got to get that timing right. <laughs> We've all been there, let's be honest. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so you've got to get the timing right of, of flicking the wheels in the air. and. But if you, if you wait for it, and you think about it, and you're halfway through a jump, you're too late. You need to be doing it just after the top car's left the ground, all four wheels are off there, whip it straight away, flick it to the left in that case, and you can get a nice point to the right. Um, a high-speed jump, like for instance the, the triple through the centre here, I would only be using the technique to actually stabilise the car if it's gone off one way or the other, because when you land, it's still, it's still a straight. And especially if you land on carpet a little bit crooked, you generally break a ball stud, yeah, mate? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or your traction roll. Yeah, yeah that's, that's what goes. So, especially carpet jumps, you want to be as straight as possible. Especially, that's a fast jump. So, for that kind of one, really what you're looking for is that if the car's starting to tilt in the air, you can use the steering to correct it. Um, the, you know, you can, like, there's different ways to do it, but normally, I guess the, the most easy way to remember is if the car starts to tilt, you steer towards the ground, and it will always steer away from the ground. <clears throat> but I would only on those really fast jumps, you just use it as a bit of correction in the air. Um, but on the slower speed jumps with the corner straight after it, you can you can definitely use these these techniques to actually point the car where you want to go. Um, the next step up from that, which is really it's it's if you watch the really pro guys, it's very hard to do it consistently, is they will actually steer as they go up the jump face as well. And then that means that as the car leaves the air, it's actually, they're changing the direction as it leaves the, as it leaves the face of the jump. How do they make it go like that and bring it back? Well, it's again the same thing with the whipping. If you, basically as soon as your car leaves the air, if you turn, you can get it. And, and if you, say for instance a tool drive, 
if you hit the brakes, you've now taken away all the gyro sort of stabilizing from the rear. Now these front tires <coughs> drive the car. You can actually get a really big whip. And then when you're in the air, you turn the other way and it comes back. If your rear tires are spinning, it won't do that as much. With a full drive though, if you jam the brakes on, none of your tires are doing anything. So it, it's, a, it's a dead grip. The really big ones you'll see is when they'll they'll actually be turning as they go up the jump. And then but on a car we might get rid of some of those cones, but you're coming from the straight, you want to be coming from a little bit further out on the track so that you make this a, uh, as wide a corner as possible. In modified, you'll generally be hitting the brakes just a sec, just a quick second there to wash off a bit of speed, and then again trying to trail brake through here, but not using too much, uh, not using too much steering lock because it's a it's a big corner. Um, generally, what we're trying to prioritise though, especially if you're driving two-wheel drive, is you want to be getting the car out of the corner properly. A two-wheel drive will accelerate really well in a straight line, but if it's cornering, its acceleration is not so good. So when you watch the the, the best guys, usually. They're not usually too wild into the corner, but normally they're pointed at the next straight very early so they can just get straight back on the power. Um, if you if you run wide in a two-wheel drive and you miss that apex and you're having to kind of bring the car in, you've just lost a lot of time. Full drive, you can be a bit more aggressive get back on the power. So about where Andrew is standing is where you want to be exiting this corner. You don't want to be too wide, but you want to be in a position where you can then just go straight up to the next corner. It's the, the earlier you can get a two-wheel drive straightened up, and you're in that final stage where your tyres are just having to accelerate the car, not having to corner the car, the quicker you're going to go. Stock's a little bit different. Stock doesn't have so much engine power, so you're not really pushing the, the, the limit of the tyre so much. So that's why in stock you tend to take a more flowing racing line to be using the, the cornering grip of the, more, uh, grip of the car more. Whereas in modified, you've got so much acceleration that you want to be able to use to get lap time. You generally in modified find that you take a slightly tighter line, you try to straighten the car up, and then you can punch out of the corner harder. We've got a few things, this next corner here, this is a bit of a step on it. <laughs> a lot of those ruts are going to get fixed, mate. Well, that's alright. We're going to fix them. So I don't mind ruts, man. I'll just let you know. Yeah. A couple of things with a corner like this. Firstly, obviously if you go too fast, the main thing that's going to happen is you're going to jump yourself past the corner. <coughs> Second thing is though, that when you're coming up, just like we talked about with the jump face, your car's going to actually have a lot of grip right here, because you're coming up to it fast, and you can actually use that that uh, acceleration to, to turn the car. So corners like this, sometimes you can come in too slow as well as going too fast. Too fast, you're going to go slipping off here. Too slow, you're not being. You, you maybe find that you're suddenly hitting this pipe all the time because the the gravity is a it's stopping the car and also it's giving you so much traction. So uh, hills into corners again, you, you can actually use that to your advantage. We had a track where we were last week in Mildura had a a hairpin like this with a jump right across the face here and if you got it right it basically was a bank to help you turn in the corner and you actually came in and you and you, you attacked it diagonally and the car sucked in and if you were just a bit fast you went flying off quickly. That's all I know from that corner so it just sucks you in. Yeah this one sucks in because you, you're actually going to get a lot of traction right here. Um, this next section especially because it's going downhill you'll probably find that you have the opposite effect the car kind of floats down the hill but really between here you're this, this corner here, you're just going to try and take the straightest line possible between this corner and where Andrew is standing there. Um, you're just going to waste time if you're too wide on that corner there. Obviously, this is there's a quite a uh, deceptive or yeah, difficult to judge perspective of this section, so that's going to just take some practice. But um, with a tight hairpin, though, one of the techniques you can use that friction circle to our advantage in flicking the car. So as we come through a corner like this here. You're not necessarily going to need to be in the maximum grip all the time. Sometimes you actually just want to rotate the car so that we're pointed towards where Lachlan is there and just be able to punch straight out. <clears throat> so in this kind of corner, sometimes you, you use the brake, turn, and then you can tap the brake again. It's like putting the handbrake on. And what you've just done is you've taken away, with the friction circle, you've taken away all the side grip of the tyre. So once you've got a car turning and you hit the, on a two-wheel drive, you hit the brakes again, it's going to flick around. And that's, that's utilising that friction circle. And that's a, on, a, on a corner like this, that can let you just rotate the car and then you're ready to punch out. Full drive, it's a bit different. Um, if you jam on the brakes too hard, what's going to happen is you're going to take the friction, the grip away from the front tyre as well as the back. So full drives take a slightly different technique. Full drive, generally what you're trying to do is brake, but then not let off the brake too hard. If you let off the brake too fast, what happens is the front sort of springs up and then you've lost all your cornering grip. Um, 
if you hold the brake on too long, you actually <coughs> lock the front tyres and you understeer. With a full drive, the technique with that friction circle is to is to kind of just slowly release the brake and keep it transferred on the front. When you get that right, it feels like the car sucks in through the corner really well. If you if you, you you'll know if you've done it wrong. If you, if your car suddenly feels like it just pushes wide, that means you've left the brake on too much. And if it doesn't feel like it turns in hard enough, you probably let it off. Really. Again, prioritising from here, we've got a slight downhill drop there, but it's this constantly curving corner. Again, especially in till drop, if we're trying to follow this curve and accelerate hard, we're probably going to get a lot of oversteer. The tyres are going to, they can't do both things at once. So, on this one, it's kind of better just to come a little bit wider so we can get the car straightened up again. The straighter we drive the cars, especially in till drive, the faster we're going to go in, in modifier. Um, aiming to where Lockie's standing there. You're coming in pretty fast here, you're coming downhill, you've built up a lot of speed into a tight corner. The braking of this next section is really critical. Um, and again, because this is a gentle <coughs> curve, what I see a lot, and I've felt it just from my runs here, is it's very easy to get on the brakes while the car's still turning, and then the car's always got this like big uh, right-hand slide happening. When you, If you can get the car straightened up, and then get on the brakes when the car's straight, you'll find that the car will brake much more effectively. Do you have any tricks on that for this section, Matt? I know you've done a lot of... I think it's easy to over brake, to over yeah. out brake yourself with this shit. Yeah. But if you're turning from here and you get on the brake, you get that slide. So try to get the car, brake on the car straight. Um, and again, this is one where you can use that friction circle. If you if you let it stay on the brake the whole time and turn, you, you're going to slide out. So you've got to come off the brake as you turn in. But when you get it right, you'll feel that will help suck the car around the corner. Just make sure that point if you're coming too close on the apex, as you're coming out, it starts getting a bit loose. Yeah. Right inside here. Yeah, if you come in too close, it gets a bit loose. Yeah. So you've got to be out, I've noticed, just out look like where you were the first time. Yeah, about here somewhere. Yeah, about there somewhere. Well, that's it. Even though this is a hairpin, because we're about to go onto a straight with big jumps, we don't need to be following this point here. We would actually, I would, I would take a jump section like this, I would generally take down the middle. There's not, there's not too much to be gained by going right to the outside. There's a lot of risk because um, the jumps don't. They're, generally, jumps aren't quite as nice on the outside. You've got the pipes. You've got more risk of another car being there. When you're in the middle of the track, you've got the biggest room. So okay. from here, we'll this, just take it about there. And there. Uh, I'll come in tighter here, but you don't have to turn it into a sharp corner. This one, if you let off the brakes early enough, you actually can make this into a radius corner. If you stay on the brakes too long, though, generally what happens is your, your car hooks around. Yeah. <clears throat> Again, just because that's where the power of drawing like the track now, you can see up there where we've drawn it, it doesn't actually end up being a hairpin. It, 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 you can make it quite a radius corner by taking your, your line right. Um, these jumps, the first one is not much point. I'm trying to get two of them. The back guys coming down as much as possible on the, uh, the car to be coming down and getting on the power on the down slope. Build up the speed here, and then the, the earlier you can build up speed, then the more you've gained through to here, and then this jump generally will be able to clear pretty easy in motor flow. In stock, I know that, that not everyone quite clears it, so if you've got a jump like this that you're not going to quite clear and you're going to hit there, you're best to slow down a bit, otherwise if you just smack into that, the cars just stop. So try to try to avoid smacking into the face of the jump. Um, I say on here, there's not too much, I wouldn't use too much fancy steering on this jump unless you feel that the car's not quite right because you need the car to stabilise before you turn into the corner. But if you come right that right and your car's pointing in the wrong direction, you might not have to go back so you're always going back towards the line. The corner here is quite deceptive. It's not a super tight corner, so you can go reasonably fast through it. But when we got here before with the juniors, I kept hitting it. <laughs> Um, we got we got an exercise from the guy standing up on the stand, and from the stand you can't see beyond about there. So we had the cone out here, and everyone was still hitting this cone. Um, this is a track where, because you've got this kind of high pipe there, part of the uh, I guess the trick of racing RC is the, the perspective of it. Um, in this case, you can kind of get yourself where all you see is the, is the wing. Um, that's where it actually helps sometimes if you're on the stand. Get someone to actually physically put your car on the apex of every corner and you can see where the car is. Sometimes where you think a curb is, is from the stand is a totally different perspective. 
Um, especially if you're at an event where you don't have a lot of practice time or you haven't had a lot of time on the track, those things can help you a lot. This one in particular, we'll do a demo up there, but you'll see you can, on the optimum line, you can hardly see your car right here. Um, again, this corner here, basically, nice smooth radius, and then you're gonna aim for the, that next corner is quite a tight corner. So, with a hump in it. So this type of corner, you're not gonna wanna necessarily carry too much speed through here because this hump's gonna upset the car. So you're pretty much aiming straight at this, at this, uh, at the dot. And we can use that braking effect to flick the car around and point the car at the next one. So when you've got a couple of low speed sections, one after the other, often in those cases, it's the, the quickest line is actually a, like a point and shoot, minimum distance. Um, you know, if this was a touring car race, I guess, Brad, you'd probably, in like 20 on five, you'd still be trying to radius your line. But generally, especially in off-road, the line often tends to get narrow. So we talked about the racing line before being the, the shortest distance. Generally, when it comes to dirt, it's also where the most grip is. Um, just the function of clay and, and soil is that the more the more it gets used, the more it packs together and the grippier it gets. So the amount of the amount of traction that's that exists here is higher than is out here. See how much dustier this stuff is, and then when you get right to the outside, that's just because there's not much traffic. On it. To groove up a track, you need water, you need the cars panning in. So you try where possible to stay close to corners. In these kind of ones where there's a couple of low speed corners one after the other, you, you pretty much just aim from apex to apex, flip the car around and punch out. Um, this one, the thinking, the main thing is you've got to jump after this corner. So where Andrew's standing, that's what we're going to be aiming for. Normally, I was saying before, you try to drive straight over a jump. In this case, if we follow this jump straight, we're going to come out to here, and then we're going to—we're not only going to make our line long here, we're going to miss that next apex. So in this case, <coughs> you are actually jumping diagonally. Now that's going to make the car um, twist a little bit when you're leaving a jump diagonally. The the last wheel to leave the jump is actually going to be the back right wheel, so it tends to make the car jump the wrong way for that next jump. So that's on this one, once the car's left, we're going to turn to the left and that's going to angle the car into the right. And ideally, we want the car to kind of drop into this valley here so that we're on the, the line to, to drive up to the next corner. And that way we're not, we're not going too far out of the corner. Um, we can use this rise to get our, our turn up. And if we've, and if we've done the, the correct steering in the air, even though the car's traveling this way, when it lands, it'll be pointing in the direction into the corner quickly. Um, I guess finally this is another one where the perspective is a bit tricky. From the stand this looks quite straight. I mean, there's actually a curve as you go down through here. So we're trying to get on the power hard. We've come out of a relatively slow speed corner, climb bit of hill. Um, this is where, especially in two-wheel drive, we need to be thinking about how hard we can get on the power and getting that weight transferred onto the back, not spinning out. Coming down the steps, you don't want to be sliding over these, you want the car to be as straight as possible. If you're sliding a little bit, they're going to grab and you're going to end up with a big fast tumble. Um, well, Line-wise, Matt, what's your suggestion through here? Do you, do you normally try to come out sort of mid-track so you've got a better line? For that one, a bit wide for this one. Okay. So kind of aiming out and then back in? Yeah. That's, yeah. So because we've got, often when you do a track walk, you need to look at what's the next couple of corners coming up. Um, if there was a, if there was a hairpin, say we're locked up, uh, sorry, I thought you know what's Okay. Well, you know, if there was a hairpin there, we'd be taking a totally different line. If there was a tight corner to the right, we probably wouldn't be, we'd probably be in the middle trying to cut down there. But when you've got a big sweeper, you want to be lining the car up so you can be as smooth as possible through that and get your line onto the next straight. So in this case, We'll come out a little bit wider. There's quite a few bumps in this corner here. Um, again, in high speed corners, if you use too much steering lock, that usually makes the car really unstable in these as well. So the faster the car goes, really try in your head to just use the minimum amount of steering you can. Um, you'd be surprised. You, you, you'll drive corners like this in the end of the straight. If you turn your steering down to 10%, you'll go through them just as fast. It's the stuff in the infield that you need all the lock for, but if you use too much lock in here, they're just going to grab the bumps. You're going to you wear tyres. Your car doesn't feel as stable. There's this nice <coughs> big uh, water rut here as well. Again, this is one. If you're sliding when you hit this, you're probably going to at least get out of shape, if not crash. 
So you try to keep the car relatively straight, but from, from where you're standing here, we're now, we're now on a straight. So get that, get the car pointed in the right direction and then you can just mash it and just go as quick as you can. Let the car drift out there. And yeah, on, on this one, if you're too, if you're too far inside, you've made the next corner cut. Anything on here, if you're too far out wide, the track actually drops off a little bit. So I wouldn't be going this far out here. Roughly here is about this kind of line, I think you'd be looking for there. And again, you can see, if you have a look at the surface of the tray, you notice the cracks are different on the racing line to where they're off the line. Um, the track's been uh, pounded a lot more by cars through this section, so it actually changes the way the dirt looks. So look for those sort of things. If you come to an established track, you can usually work out the racing line by looking at the, the way that the dirt looks as well. <coughs> Assuming everyone else is taking a good one. <laughs> All right. Um, I don't know, does anyone here do track walks usually? You guys do them? That's good. Yeah, really important. Um, cost nothing. You'll find a lot more information out than by standing up on the stand. Um, yeah, you hear a lot, sometimes people, oh, why did my car keep crashing there? Why does it keep crashing there? When they actually walk down, they realise there's either a rut or the way that they, they think it's a straight and it's got a curve or there's a bump they didn't realise. This is, when you get to any track, you do a track walk before you put a car down. Um, even on a club day, if you've been to the track a lot, walk around because you don't know where we're in off-road there might be a pothole that's developed um, you know there, in this case there might be some jumps that have been changed um, after rain you can get ruts all those sort of things so yeah keep, keep walking out on the track all right what we'll do from here um, if there's no more questions is we'll get a couple of cars out I'll get Myself, Matt and Andrew, we'll do a couple of laps and we'll demonstrate some of these techniques, especially the jumping techniques, I think. Um, also, the I think we'll start with the acceleration. I was talking before about trying to feel the, the acceleration and demonstrate the difference between mashing it, being too slow, and then getting that, that feeling right. And you can see the difference and you can hear the difference in the way that it's driven. And then we'll do a couple of uh, jump demos and then we can just get into it, right? All right. started to move and it's, it's accelerating you can keep feeding the power on. Rather than it doing just off the wheel spin it actually drives forward harder. Is that, is that kind of easy to see? Certainly as a driver you can feel it, you can feel the way that it launches off better. Um, that's a really important technique to practice and it, it varies from track to track and this is one of the things that the warm-up lap's really important, right? Nowadays, we're lucky. When I started racing, we didn't even wiggle the, steer the steering before a race, let alone do a couple of laps. You get a warm-up lap now. Um, with your warm-up lap, feel for the track. The track will change from race to race. This is the kind of thing you can feel. You'll often see the guys on a, on a warm-up lap being a little bit more aggressive out of a corner. What I try to find on a warm-up lap is that limit of how hard I can pull the trigger, especially if there's any tight corners on the track. And yeah, can, has the track changed to the point where I can pull it a bit harder, or do I need to be a bit smoother on the power? Up? So yeah, this um, this kind of feeding the power on, uh, it's really that easy. Rather than just full power, the power always kind of slides around. When you smooth on the power, it drives away much nice more. So this is also where you can show the, the uh, see the friction circle of braking. So if I just turn the no brakes, you can see the car, it's, it's very lazy in the way it feels. So this is, this is no brakes at all. Now if I use the brakes halfway through, you can see that the car suddenly rotates a little bit. Right? And you can get it to, you've got to get the car turning and then turn brake, turn brake. Um, if I come in, if I brake in a straight line, the car will brake straight. But if I brake in a straight line and try and turn, it really quickly rips around. Even just a little bit, it rips around fast. So 
when you get it right, you can use the brakes to help really turn the car in like that there. And if you want, you can make the brake give the car a lot more steering. Just a little bit of brake. And even just this kind of figure eight practicing, it's good to practice those, those hairpins where you want to rip it around. So you can set up a cone, a little bit of brake, and you can get it to turn very, very quickly. Again, no brake, I'll get that. You can see how much more delayed the car is without any brake. So that combination of braking and turning together, blending those, you can either use them to make the car turn harder or turn less or rotate around. But if you think about the friction circle and what you're doing, I think it, personally for me, it makes it a lot easier to understand how it taps. Is that, is that clear? Any questions on that part? Do you guys have anything more to add, Andrew or Matt? So you would uh, use the brakes in just about every corner? Um, look, I use uh, on this track, and to be honest, I've only done two packs here. Um, I would use the brakes where where you're approaching a corner fast, and you need to wash off some speed and get the car to turn in. In the case of the straight here, I just tap the brake enough just to wash a bit of speed off and get to pull through there. When you've got sections that you've got to wash a lot of speed off, yeah. I use the brake. If you the trouble with a corner like this turn one here, though, if you use too much brake your car's going to get very unstable. So the faster an electric motor goes, the less brake you need to use. The, the braking becomes more effective as it turns faster. So in terms of how much brake I use, at here I'd probably only use a quarter or a half, and you'll find the car will still stop quite fast. But um, I don't use it every fast corner, but I use it every slow corner. Yeah. Would, would that be different how you use it? Would that be in, in line with how much drag brake? Yeah, I run quite a lot of drag brake on my car, but you'll find that, for instance, in um, if you, I remember reading an interview with um, Cavalieri one time. He runs no drag brake and he push brakes every single corner. And when you get that practice, if you if you go out on a track and it's best to do it when there's no one else around because you've got to kind of really concentrate on your car and listen to it. If you just rest on the brake into every corner, you find that actually you don't have to change the steering, you change the brake, and the car will change how much it steers. The more you brake, the more it steers. The less you brake, the less it steers. So you can you can try a corner like, for instance, the one after the triple would be a good example. It's quite fast, but if you've got understeer, you're going to miss the apex. You just rest on the brake there, and you'll find the car will tuck in. And if it's not turning enough, add a little bit more brake. And if it's turning too much, you just release the brake, and you can actually you can steer the car without changing the steering. Yeah, so it's quite effective, especially on a two-wheel drive. It's very effective. But yeah, I'd, if you've got more drag brake, obviously you don't need to use quite as much. But um, the main thing with motors is yeah, the faster the car's going, the less you actually need to physically brake to get the effectiveness. At low speed, you can be much more aggressive with the brake. Um, thanks, if I go... Okay. Let me just get off the so in terms of slow, this, this is full brake now. See, the car pulls up there. So it's pretty stable. But if I, if I come through at a higher speed, See how it locks up? So that, that, the electric motor becomes much more effective at, at the faster it's going, the stronger the brakes are. So that's one, that's probably one of the more important things to think about is its speed, is to be very gentle on the, and you don't need to be so aggressive on the brake to actually make the brake, like that's, that's maybe 20% brake. Yeah. And then if you, if you lock up on the brake, then you let off, the car gets stable. So yeah, you, can, you can actually use the, you can use the brake, to control the attitude of the car. And in fact, if you watch, like, say, uh, professional go-kart races or even IndyCar and F1, the really good drivers, they hardly turn their steering wheel. Yeah, they, they, they use the throttle and the brake to adjust the attitude of the car. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's it. Because what you should be doing is operating on the, the maximum amount of slip of the tyre. So if you're on that optimum point, it's actually not super responsive to steering, so you've said, okay, I've already given the tyre the most amount of grip I can do, now we'll just balance it with the, the rear tyre friction circle. Right. I'm running 18% uh, in my tool drive and about 9 in my full drive. It's very dependent on the speed control and also the brake frequency that you have. Strong brake, like I run very low brake frequencies, and that gives very strong low speed braking uh, out of the speed control. Um, if you've got um, a much higher brake frequency, the braking becomes much smoother, but at low speed I find it's not, not enough 
in, in off-road, you know, most of the times we really want the brakes to be effective is in those real tight corners. We want it, we want it to be effective at low speed. Yeah. You can see here, like, this is just enough to make the car rip around at, at, at really low speed, but at high speeds it's, it's still too much, so I do a lot of tuning. If I'm tuning my brakes, I'll pick the lowest speed corner on the track and make sure I've got enough brake to rip around it, and then the high speed corner on the track and make sure it's smooth enough that I can brake without it getting out of shape. Yeah. Running drag brake also is a thing a lot of the older um, the guys that have been around a long time use. Um, because <laughs> I, I use drag brake as well. So th those of you and most of you would have used brushless motors, yeah? Uh, brushless motors are what we have in there now. Um, brush motors that which we used to run had a lot of natural drag because we had brushes on the commutator putting drag on the actual, uh, on the drive line. Um, so a lot of guys that have been around longer than 10 years will run drag brake because that's how they've got their driving style used to um, and they feel comfortable with that and their corner entry, corner exit is catered for that um, whereas a lot of the guys um, that have gotten into it more recently won't run any drag brake and the pros don't run it because they're just faster and better. Yeah. So They don't run drag brake but they will brake every single corner. Yeah. If you stand next to them on the stand, they, but only fine amounts, like they're not mashing the brake on, they're, they're, they're I guess what's the word, trimming the car with the brake all the time. It takes a lot of practice. Um, I find it really hard. Yeah. One thing, sorry, the one thing the drag brake does not notice, it kills you. You gain 20, 30 degrees of heat just by using drag brake and stop motor. That's yeah. another thing you've got to worry about. I think that's another yeah, point. Of, most of what I'm talking about here is obviously very modified related. Stock motors have their nuances. Every time you brake, we, we didn't used to brake much in bra with uh, brush motors either because you'd destroy the comp. Like it would just destroy it in a run. So you, you nowadays, like full drive, you just yeah, mash the brake like there's no tomorrow. Um, if you did that, you'd, you'd be retreating your comp every run. So, But it does generate heat. So in stock where heat is king, that's why, that's another reason why in stock you probably tend to fly, find a a more flowing racing line helps you because you're generating less heat in the motor. Whereas in modified, we're, we're not worried about heat. Um, we're not worried about runtime. We're not worried about it sort of softening up. We can just just go for it. So there's that. That's where your racing line and the way you drive is not just a function of the car and the tyres and the track. It's also your drivetrain and, and what else you're trying to do. Um, you know, one of the, the things, like to be honest, you know, we're, we're obviously here to, tomorrow. We're running on it's going to be 27 degrees. The control tyre for next week. That's not its real optimum kind of performance. It's, it's designed for a damper or cooler condition. So in that, if you start driving on the limit of the tyre the whole time, you might find that you're actually, at three minutes, going to overheat your tyre. So that's where you might try to be a little bit less aggressive on the brake and a little bit less aggressive in the way that you transition it and reducing the wheel spin because that, that's all about energy. Anytime you get wheel spin, you're actually creating a lot of heat energy. On the flip side, if you're ever in a control tyre event where the tyre is too hard for the track, which we've been at, you know, Sometimes it's the very first run in the morning, it's not the ideal compound. That's when, like the warm-up lap, you just put as much heat as you can into the tyre. You get it spinning, you lock it up, you do whatever you can to... The, the faster you're going, the more energy you put in. So if you if you jam on the brakes and you slide it through turn one here, you're going to get a lot of temperature in your tyre. If you've got a tyre that's going to overheat, you want to be... In the low speed, it's not so bad, but in the high speed ones, you probably want to back it off just a touch, and then that way you can keep the temperature down in the tyre. Yeah. If anyone has any questions about dry frequencies, brake frequencies, drag brake or anything like that, feel free to come and see us afterwards. Yeah. Um, we've got set up boxes here, we can junior speedy answer any questions or anything like that for Reedy, Hobby, Lynn, Ryan, anything. So. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Alright. Um, I jumped. Should we do a jump down there? Yeah. I'll do it. No, I'll <laughs> Um, I think it's just because we've, oh, in Mildura we did it, we had everyone on the stand because they had a big map around, but we can't get 30 people on the stand here, so I reckon we'll do it from, uh, if we do it from down here, maybe you go on the stand, yeah. and then I'll talk through. Okay. So here is the difference between, uh, as you asked before Jim, um, first one will just be a, a jump and a flat land with no landing on the power. The second one, he's going to attitude and get on the power before it lands and show you Firstly, that the car settles quicker, but also just that, that sudden rush that the car gets from acceleration. So, first one just a flat land around it. You hear how it really slack when it hit the ground? And like the back tyre is going to bounce off. 
But you see how the, the slingshot, when it landed, landing on the power, and how much speed that then carried over the jump, right? And also that it actually landed down. So this first one's the, the classic technique I was saying before we leave the... See, even then he hit the brakes, the car didn't come down. It's too late. And it was only like... He was on the brakes, not far off the takeoff. Basically, he was off the throttle up the face. The foot of takeoff, and then the car was already settled, and then he was back on the throttle, just letting the tires spin all the way through. And the car flies really low and flat. Um, do you want to try just one, just completely jamming the brakes on and holding in the air, Andrew? Yeah. Just to see that. Sometimes you can see that kind of float. See how the car lost its stability and didn't land straight? That's what happens when you've got no tires in the car. So, Matt Griffin's probably the best jumper that I've ever worked with or raced against. And his philosophy is if things start to go pear shaped, just pin the throttle. Because um, even if the car doesn't necessarily aim where you want it to be, it usually stabilizes itself. But you can see there, I don't know how you can see, but that, that kind of brick effect where it just it started floating and then it didn't land straight, it didn't land, it didn't land straight. And that's how you bust um, ball studs, it's how you bust braces that's that's one of the classic kind of using too much uh, as we call it jump tricks too much jump trick to actually control the car but you've lost the stability whatever you do try to the smoother you are the more the wheels spin um, as Andrew did on his second demo um, if you want to jump nose down do it from the start of the jump and then get the wheel spinning and then your car if you can get the nose down early and then just have the wheels spinning gently all the way through the jump you've got a really stable jump Next one, whipping. Uh, what I'm going to do this time, Andrew, is uh, uh, a, a normal attitude jump, but uh, we've got a left-hand corner just, just after here. So I'm going to get Andrew to do a right turn um, as early as you can after you leave the take. Uh, maybe, I guess, I'll let you, whether you need to recover it or not, but we'll get him to turn to the right. And what you'll see the car do is the car will not only slightly turn itself to the left, okay? And you see, just before he landed, he steered it back up and the car went back level. But see how you can actually control that now. You're going to do it with the brakes on. So that that gets more attitude in the car. You had, you had a bit of throttle on there, yeah? Yeah. yeah. See how much more attitude that got? So that's what you were asking for, Jim. When you, when you stop the back wheels from spinning and you use the front to do the inertia, you can get some crazy stuff. But as we saw before, you've got to be ready for it. If there's a crosswind or anything, when you stop the wheels from turning, there's always a risk that you get blown around a lot more. Um, on this jump, quite honestly, there's probably not as much benefit from it. So we're going to move to the back triple, and Andrew, I'm going to get you to do some Mr. Whippies out here. Okay. 
trips to it. <laughs> so I think the best oh, yeah, if everybody yeah. watches on the far the far yeah. side there, that'd be the best. Yeah, so Bill, you're gonna start doing that. Alright, so I guess first lap Andrew, just straight. Diagonal but straight. So in this case, I mean one of the tricks of jumping as we said is about the distance. So the distance you jump, all these tricks in the world don't change how far you jump basically. But okay, so that's jumping straight there. Alright, give it with a left wing, mate. Yes, that's what I was talking about when it happens when you turn to the other side. You'll notice that things start to happen fast when you do this, right? Um, that little part of a second. But when you saw how much attitude you get on the car, so that was probably just the first one was getting just leaving a little bit too much in there. Alright, oh, Lockie, stand back now. That was it. Yeah, a little bit of steering to the left through the air. The car, when it lands, it's pointed into the jump. It actually lands better, and you can get around the corner quicker. Throw in the wrong way, Andrew, just to demonstrate, mate. Yeah. So it's one of the mistakes that I think you can make automatically as you try to turn the car towards the, the corner. You actually, in the air, you have to think everything works backwards. So when he turned to the right, not only was his car angled the wrong way, it's pointed the wrong way, and when he landed, he just went miles offline. So that's kind of, I guess, the this this kind of section here is where you can use that steering wheel to your advantage. For sure. yeah, and you can get this quite a lot of attitude on the car. You can really get the car worked up on the on, on its side. Um, it takes a fair bit of practice to make sure you land it straight and to be able to do it every single lap all the time, but yeah. hopefully this is clear. This, this is a, a good example of where it's actually good. I can see a lot of people trying to do these tricks when they're not really necessary and all they do is risk your car. Like on a big triple like that one there, I mean, you don't really need to do anything there. Yeah. It doesn't really slow down, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know, has anyone ever played around with that stuff, or is that, is that making a bit of sense? Is that, is that uh, maybe open up a bit of eyeball as to, I guess, how the steering works? You know, you watch the good guys, they do a lot of very quick reactions, but it's all about when you're in the air, turning the steering, the car will go the opposite direction. It'll not only roll the opposite direction, it'll actually steer a little bit. You've got to make sure you land. You see how sideways the car's landing here. On this jump, that's not a problem, but on that big triple, that is a problem. Um. Um. I don't know, does anyone have any questions? I guess that's the first thing. Um, I know we had especially from the jumping side to talk about that a bit. Are there any, any questions on that? Should stop be able to clear the triple? Should stop be able to? Yeah. Oh, oh, no. <laughs> Not with the control motor. Okay. Can do this one now. The track's been all rapid. It's been a lap or two for feeling the traction. Yeah. Right, so from these corners, yeah, that little bit of break through there, straightening it up so you're pointed in the right direction. Here, breaking in a straight line. See how close you can take that one as well? You can actually get right in here and the car disappears. Oh, I feel it. Oh, no! Oh, no! Oh, no. <laughs>
So at the end of the straight there, just that little bit of braking when the car straight, but if you hold the brake too long, it's going to make it spin. That's full on the brake there, how the car slips, slides. Mm -hmm. that's, that's when you hold the brake on just that bit too long. Mm -hmm. These tight corners are the view that the mm -hmm. This one, if I get on the brake too early, see it, it also holds. Because the car slips in, you lose really, really control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Trying to minimise wheel spin out of those corners, but just lean on the throttle. So that, that technique of... Um, the technique is how you accelerate away. You try to feel that out at every corner, not just out of, not just off the line. But when you get it right, you, if you ever see a car with a really good hole shot off the line, that's, that's a way to get that. So practice it on your warm up as well. I'm always looking a little bit ahead, and every time I get to a straight, I take a glance down the straight. Um, you never know what's actually down the straight. Yeah, in practice. It's